Okay, so our next guest is a senior research scientist at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He was a project scientist of NASA's 2001 Mars Odyssey project. He's also a team member of the Mars's project, the Mars Advanced Radar for Subsurface and Ionosphere Sounding, and the shallow radar uh, on board MRO Sherrod, which is a Mars shallow radar sounder. He's also uh, working, worked on radars uh, studying Europa and Ganymede. Um, and he'll be talking about the evidence for shallow subsurface ice in the mid-latitudes of Mars. So please give it up to Jeffrey J. Plop. So uh, I was asked to, uh, to uh, address this topic, and I think it's of interest uh, to a lot of folks who uh, are looking forward to uh, uh, the utilization of water resources on Mars uh, to support uh, some kind of mission, whether it's robotic or more likely human, uh, for various purposes. Uh, obviously, water is, is useful for supporting human life and for supporting other kinds of life and also has been identified as a key resource actually for uh, uh, manufacturing fuel on Mars. So uh, you guys actually are the experts in, the, in those kinds of topics. I'm a, I'm a planetary scientist and my specialty is, is uh, um, geological remote sensing, so I'm looking at things from the standpoint of geology, not as much from uh, uh, the standpoint of, of human exploration. But what I'd like to talk about is these uh, uh, very interesting uh, regions that we've been able to identify on Mars that seem to contain H2O in the form of ice uh, in uh, parts of Mars that are actually relatively speaking, uh, benign environments uh, for uh, surface missions. That is, they're not at the poles, they're not in places where you have uh, many months of, of uh, a polar winter um, and where the temperatures are not nearly so extreme as, as you might uh, find in the polar and arctic regions where um, the, the ice resources are perhaps a little more obvious. So, um, I think it's not news to anyone that uh, we have all kinds of evidence that water has existed at the surface of Mars in the geologic past and that water has flowed across the surface of Mars in many, uh, in many regions. Uh, what you see up, up here on the screen is an example from uh, the, uh, the boundary region between the highlands and the northern plains of Mars where um, what we call the massive outflow events occurred that uh, carved great canyons and, and uh, moved a lot of material around. Um, and uh, over the years, uh, folks who have studied these things have done calculations uh, about uh, just how much water uh, actually was needed to do the amount of work, the, uh, the, the erosion and the movement of material um, just so that we can sort of get a handle on, well, what was the inventory of water on Mars in the past and uh, what might it be today? So uh, the, this question of, of, well, just how much water does Mars have, did it have, uh, uh, might it have in the future, uh, we like to express it in a, sort of a, a convenient shorthand uh, unit, which is the global equivalent water layer. So imagine you took some huge amount of water and you spread it out evenly over the entire sphere of Mars. H how deep would that uh, layer of water be? So um, using the, uh, the models of, of uh, erosion and, and the, our understanding of erosional processes on the Earth, uh, the folks who, who looked at those uh, great uh, erosional channels and, and outflow deposits uh, estimated on the order of hundreds of meters of what we call this global equivalent water layer. It's not to say that Mars was covered by an ocean everywhere that deep, but that amount of water was, was needed to, uh, to do that geologic work. So that's actually a significant amount of water, hundreds of meters. Now, it's not 
100, it's not 1,000, it's on the order because this, these kinds of things are very difficult to estimate, but it gives you an idea of sort of the ballpark, the order of magnitude of the amount of water uh, that actually has been at the surface of Mars doing this work. Now, it could be that water was recycled and maybe some of the same water did the, did the work twice, and that's why there's a, an, another reason why there's the uncertainties on these numbers. But still, the, the water that we currently observe on Mars is much less than that. And I'll go through some of the numbers in a minute. But the, the question then becomes, where did all that water go? And this, uh, along with the question of, of could uh, Mars have ever uh, hosted life in the past or currently, uh, these are sort of the biggest questions about Mars that the, uh, the planetary science community faces. Where did all that water go? Um, we have a lot of evidence that there was loss through the atmosphere, that the water became vapor and uh, somehow uh, migrated to the top of the atmosphere and was stripped away by solar wind or other processes. Uh, the, the MAVEN mission that's currently at Mars right now is, is uh, uh, designed to, to address this very question, the atmospheric loss to space. Uh, in that case, Mars never gets the water back. It's gone for good, right? Uh, but there is very clearly still a substantial amount of that, that total inventory uh, still either on or inside or, or both uh, the, the planet surface and subsurface today. So um, we, we have no doubt there's plenty of H2O on Mars. It's just a question of exactly where do we go to get it and where do we go, where can we go where it's, it's easy, relatively easy to, to access. So here's a, a, a short list, and it may not be complete, but uh, it's a pretty good list, I think, of the, the current reservoirs of H2 on Mars as we understand them. Of course, there's the polar ice caps, and these are by far the largest confirmed known reservoirs of H2O on Mars. Um, there's, uh, and I'll get into this, there's, there's ground ice that we've been able to detect from orbit and actually go and touch on the surface with a lander such as the Phoenix lander uh, at the high latitudes. Now when I say high latitudes, I'm really talking about maybe what you think of as from the Arctic Circle to the pole on, uh, on the Earth, so in the, from 60 degrees latitude to the poles north and south. And then there is a, a, a more recent evidence, and this is actually something I'm going to talk about in some detail, for ground ice in the, in the mid-latitudes, okay? Maybe not right at the equator, but say in the 30 to, to 55 to 60, in that kind of middle temperate zone, like the zone that, that we're in, for example, here in, in Pasadena. There are what we believe are, are remnants of ancient uh, glaciers and ice sheets uh, from uh, previous uh, regimes of the Mars climate, and I'll talk about that in some detail. Uh, uh, water can also be tied up in minerals, hydrous minerals, uh, such as gypsum is one example. Uh, we know that exists on the Mars surface. Um, groundwater, actual liquid water, at some depth below the surface, the temperatures are, are warm enough that uh, that, that, freezing, uh, that that freezing boundary uh, is crossed and it's quite possible that there's liquid water in the subsurface of Mars. And then of course there's the atmosphere which we know is extremely thin and the water makes only a small uh, fraction of the atmosphere but it plays an important role because it is through the atmosphere that uh, water can move around the planet. Okay, so this is a, um, a, a map. I don't know how it shows up on the screen. Oh, looks pretty good, okay. Um, the, uh, this mission that you heard in the introduction that I, I work on, the 2001 Mars Odyssey mission, one of the, the first and, and important uh, discoveries made uh, by the instruments on that spacecraft, uh, is represented here in this map. And this is uh, using the, uh, the neutron spectrometer. It's from the emission of neutrons that are, are uh, re uh, reaction products of cosmic rays striking the surface of Mars. Uh, it's very sensitive to the presence of hydrogen in the soil, and uh, we were able to uh, map the entire planet of Mars and basically estimate the hydrogen, and here it's expressed, uh, let's suppose all of that hydrogen in the upper uh, uh, several feet or about a half of a meter 
of the soil. Let's suppose all that hydrogen was uh, contained in H2O molecules. What would the fraction by mass of that soil uh, be in terms of ice? So basically uh, what we were able to confirm was what uh, was predicted by uh, a lot of folks who, who thought about these things, uh, that in the highest latitudes, you can see here from 60 degrees to the pole in both the north and the south, there are these deep blue colors and even this purple color, which is a, that, which tells you that the, the, again, we're only sensitive with these neutrons to the upper half meter or so, but that that soil is, is in the, uh, on the order of 20, 30, 40, even more percent ice right there at the surface, right there. So if you're willing to go to those very cold, nasty places that have, uh, uh, you know, um, months-long uh, uh, polar nights, then go there and you, you'll find your H2O uh, right there in the soil, and that's what the Phoenix lander actually detected uh, uh, in situ. Uh, now, what's, since those are rather challenging places for missions, for landed missions, uh, the question is, what about these other areas in these lower latitudes and the temperate latitudes uh, that seem to have at least uh, maybe a few percent, maybe up to 10 percent, uh, um, equivalent water. Basically, the thinking right now is most of that is wrapped up in minerals, and that's not ice grains in the soil. And there are thermodynamic reasons that uh, basically the atmosphere would tend to suck the ice out of the soil if there is a contact between the, uh, the very dry Mars atmosphere and any ice grains. And so uh, based on, on those arguments and also what we've learned about the chemistry of Mars and the mineralogy, we believe that most of the, uh, the variations in the amount of, of uh, equivalent uh, water in those uh, uh, mid-latitude and, and low-latitude regions is, is tied up in minerals and is not so easy to access, although uh, some would argue that if you can cook a hydrous mineral, you can release that water and then you can use that water. Um, we have had a flotilla of spacecraft at Mars uh, in, in orbit looking at the surface uh, now for, uh, let's see, going back to uh, about uh, uh, the year 90, 1997, I think, was when uh, Mars Global Surveyor arrived. And we've been continuously watching the surface of Mars in that time. And one of the, the very interesting and, and exciting phenomena that we've been able to monitor is the creation of new impact craters. Obviously, impact craters are a major landform on Mars, but there are, there's a whole category of impacts that seem to be revealing the presence of this shallow ground ice uh, as a result of an impact of, of a, a fragment of a meteor or a chunk of a comet or something like that. And you see an example here. These are from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, high-rise camera, the high-resolution camera. Uh, you can see kind of a, a, a black splotch, which uh, is an indication of a recent impact, and then the, the bright, icy-looking uh, crater that uh, shows up in the high-resolution images. Also, the series of frames that you see on the bottom there, those six frames, are uh, two, two uh, impact craters that apparently formed in a in single event of uh, an object that's at somewhere along the way split up into two. And there was ice exposed in the bottom of these craters, but after about 100 days or so, that ice tended to fade into the background uh, uh, of the surrounding soils. And uh, we believe that that's a combination of the sublimation, again, because the atmosphere, the dry atmosphere of Mars likes to suck that uh, exposed ice dry, um, and also the movement of, of perhaps du dust to, uh, to, to cover up that ice. But very clearly, this is an indication, and these are in areas where the neutrons uh, were not able to see uh, the ice in very shallow le uh, levels. So this is, th this is now sl maybe slightly deeper, maybe uh, a meter or more uh, depth. Uh, if, if you just dig a little bit, uh, you're going to find that, that ice fairly close to the surface. A uh, very recent result that I think maybe some of you uh, heard about just a few months back was uh, exposures of ice, uh, again, away from the polar regions. This is, uh, in this case, around 55 degrees south, so that's kind of in that boundary zone between the high and the mid-latitudes. Uh, but <coughs> the, um, again, using Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, combined image data 
with uh, the uh, spectral data that, that confirmed that this was indeed outcrops of water ice in these scarps. And uh, the, uh, the terrains here are, um, uh, th they have a lot of characteristics on their surface that remind us of, of what we call paraglacial or Arctic type terrains, per uh, permafrost type terrains on the earth. And in uh, many of these areas where we, we don't necessarily see this outcrop of ice, we see the morphology on the surface that's similar to these areas, which gives us a hint that maybe those areas also contain uh, some of this uh, ice-rich material in the shallow subsurface. Now I'm gonna uh, talk a bit about uh, uh, radar. So uh, there are currently two uh, radar sounders that we uh, sometimes call ground penetrating radars at Mars. One is the, the Marsis uh, uh, system on the uh, European uh, Space Agency's Mars Express spacecraft and also the Sharad uh, shallow radar. Uh, which is on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. They're sort of complementary. One works in a, in a low frequency range and is able to penetrate deeply. The other has a higher frequency, which gives it not so, so much penetration depth, but a, a higher vertical resolution. And uh, we use these, uh, these systems to basically take uh, profiles uh, that result in what looks like images that are sort of like a cross section through the subsurface, and I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, but first of all, I want to show you a result that um, is from the um, just looking at the echoes of the ra that the radar obtains from the surface itself. And I got to look over here. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, unfortunately the slide uh, apparently got uh, got chopped up a little bit, but I think it still sends the message, which is uh, that we're able to estimate the electrical properties of the upper now 10 meters or so. Remember, the, the neutrons are only looking at the first half meter. Here we're using this long wavelength radar, and we're looking at a few tens of meters, maybe uh, 20, 25 uh, meters, the average properties of that surface. And uh, what our global survey using the uh, MARSIS instrument told us is that in the northern hemisphere in particular, where you see those, those kind of bluish colors, we have a, a low value of this electrical property called the dielectric constant, the, uh, the radar, basically the radar reflectivity. And this is consistent with ice. This is the same value that we see in the polar regions, but it gives us a hint that perhaps these, uh, especially in the northern plains, that there uh, may be a significant amount of ice in the, in the upper uh, 30, 20 to 30 meters or so. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to um, uh, some uh, studies that we've done in this uh, boundary region between the, um, uh, the southern highlands and the northern plains, and you can see the latitude and longitude here, this area called Deuteronilus Mense. Um, what's been uh, interesting about this region, uh, going all the way back to the Viking days, is that there are features that remind people from, simply from imagery of, of glacial landforms. And uh, so you can see the little box that points you to, to uh, that area. And then you see this uh, uh, largish uh, multi-ring crater there. I just want to emphasize the scale bar here by showing, uh, oh, I'm, it, I think I have a Mac to PC problem here. Anyway, that, that area, uh, this, this image, if you can see the scale bar, is 400 kilometers there, that black bar. From edge to edge here, this is uh, about the entire uh, west, uh, uh, western states of the U.S., from uh, California to the state of Washington. So it is a very big place. Um, now, uh, what's interesting is that these, these features that we call sometimes the lobate debris aprons are these, these uh, materials that seem to have, have been plastered on and then flowed away from high topography. And I'm going to zoom in on one of these. Uh, here, and you can see this uh, sort of uh, high ridge and then this surrounding apron of material with what appear to be uh, uh, flow lines and crevasses and, and other kinds of features which are quite familiar to glaciologists uh, uh, studying glaciers on Earth. So uh, uh, going back again to the Viking days, it was suspected that maybe there was a role for uh, ground ice in, in creating these things. So we went and we had a look with our radar system and um, I'm going to have to move kind of fast here, so 
uh, forgive me if, if not all of this is obvious or clear, but basically what you're looking at there in the, in the top panel is this, this slice, this kind of uh, uh, two-dimensional vertical slice or cross-section through the terrain. And then in the lower panel, you can see the ground track, which is uh, an, an image in this case uh, of where the radar was, fl was flying across. And so as the radar flies uh, from left to right along that line, it's going over basically uh, flat terrain terrain, when it intercepts the boundary of this uh, low bait apron, you can see that uh, where those two arrows are, the signal splits into two, and you see one which follows the upper surface, and, but then you see also that lower one. That is the radar wave penetrating through the apron material and, and uh, obtaining an echo from the, the lower boundary of it um, below. So. Um, typically, since it's a radar, we're, look, we're looking at the time delay. We're, we're measuring how much energy comes back at what time. And it, that doesn't automatically tell you how deep something is. But if you can estimate or, or have a guess at what the material is, you can say, OK, we know radar waves travel at a certain speed through ice. They travel at a different speed through solid rock. If we play around with that, uh, uh, that speed of the wave, then it tells us something about the material. So uh, each of those arrows is pointing to a subsurface detection through these uh, lobate aprons, these glacial-like fe features. When we take the value of the speed of the wave in ice, and we then convert this slice from time to depth, you notice all those arrows. All, all of those positions line up into, into a straight line. And really what's happening there is uh, it, it tells us that we're, we're probably on the right track, that in fact that, that using the speed of the wave in ice is the, uh, um, is we're on the right track. We're probably looking at ice. Now, we have some other, other reasons that we might suspect that this is ice. And uh, again, it goes back to the geomorphology uh, that people have studied for decades. And also there are climate models that tell us in these boundary zones between the high topography and the lower northern plains, these are areas where weather systems, if in fact Mars had a, a, a denser atmosphere in the past that was able to, uh, to generate snowfall and build up ice sheets, these are the locations where you, where you would expect to find that. Now you might ask, well, if there are glaciers on Mars, today in the middle latitudes, why aren't they all uh, uh, just sublimating into the atmosphere? What we see here is that the surface is, is coated with a layer of soil uh, or debris, and that is debris that is shed from the high, surrounding high topography, and this actually acts as, as an armor, as a barrier to the sublimation of the ice from below. And our estimates based on the travel time and also the strength of the echoes that are coming from the, the base of these icy deposits is that underneath that, that soil layer, that regolith layer, you have uh, uh, basically a block of nearly pure water ice. And these are um, up to uh, a kilometer in some areas thickness, so hundreds of meters. There's plenty of ice that anybody could have any possible use for as long as you can get past that, that debris layer, which we estimate to be uh, five to 10 meters thick, uh, then you have that ice uh, ready for access, ready for whatever use you might want to put it to. And uh, over the course of several years, we've been able to map out the, the locations of this uh, thick ice. And again, remember, you're looking at a, a, an image here uh, that's about the, uh, the length of the state of California. And that's a lot of ice. That's a lot of options if you can get your, uh, your spacecraft down uh, into that part of Mars, which is actually not an especially challenging uh, part of Mars to land a spacecraft. Um, in some other areas, we've used the radar to, uh, to, to look at some very interesting uh, um, um, uh, tra what we call radar transparent uh, units, which we interpret to be ice rich. Uh, this is, again, in this mid-latitude Northern Plains kind of boundary zone uh, in uh, Arcadia Planitia, which is sort of north of Olympus Mons, if you uh, can get your bearings on that map. Uh, again, we have these fresh impacts occurring in, in this same area, revealing the ice, so we know that there's ice in the shallow subsurface there. And uh, 
uh, this is also a place where we see these very interesting and kind of enigmatic uh, uh, impact crater forms, uh, which have uh, these double terraces. You can tell, but these are topo topo maps. They're, the colors are the the topography there, um, where it seems that the the uh, an impact into uh, a layered medium where you probably have uh, an ice rich layer and an ice poor layer and at that boundary you get these uh, these terraces and the impact craters it, it adds to the evidence that there's uh, um, potentially uh, usable ice in these um, uh, mid-latitude uh, plains regions one er other area both in Marsis and Sharad that we've uh, seen uh, uh, really interesting deep echoes is something called the Medusa Fosse Formation. Uh, and this is uh, uh, a, uh, a, a large occurrence of a, of a very sort of unique, even for Mars, uh, kind of uh, morphology uh, of material that uh, the radar sees right through. And uh, there's still not a consensus out there in the community whether the radar is seeing through uh, a, a low density uh, rock deposit or perhaps a mixture of ice and dust or a, a very ice rich deposit. Um, we, we can't really rule out the possibility of ice at the moment, uh, but this is, this is an area that's uh, open for uh, further study. Uh, I should say it was pointed out to me just the other day that uh, this is not far from the um, the Curiosity MSL uh, Mars Science Laboratory uh, landing site. And in fact, the top of that great mound in Gale Crater that, um, uh, that Curiosity is exploring is that actually consists of the same material, this Medusa Fosse material. And if it is indeed ice rich or there's somehow a, a role for water ice in the formation of this material, uh, it's, it's possible that Later on in Curiosity's mission, as it works its way up uh, Mount Sharp, it might be able to access some, uh, some pieces of this material that have, have rolled down slope. Okay, so uh, to wrap up, uh, I'll just uh, give sort of a, a, a brief uh, summary of, of where we are in terms of this H2O inventory. And again, using the, the units of the equivalent global layer thickness, um, uh, reminding you that the current atmosphere has just a tiny, tiny amount of H2O. But again, it, uh, given enough time, uh, it provides the pathway for the ice to move around. And certainly, if there were a, a previous climate regime where there was a thicker atmosphere and a more active uh, sort of water cycle invol involving snowfall, uh, more widespread around the planet, then the atmosphere obviously plays a much bigger role. Uh, the, the ground ice that we see with the neutron and gamma rays, it only amounts to uh, uh, you know, less than a meter of equivalent global thickness because, again, we're only sampling the first half meter or so of the soil. So we really don't know how deep that ice is. Uh, in the, as, I, as I pointed out, and I didn't really talk much about the polar ice. This is a great target for our radars because we see all the way through the polar ice. Um, uh, this is where the, the vast bulk of our known H2O uh, reserves exist today. And, but I should point out that in terms of this global uh, equivalent layer, it's only a few tens of meters when, in fact, we calculated that we need hundreds of meters to carve out those channels. So there's still a, a big missing chunk. Uh, of the water inventory. Um, and again, we, we are now looking at this shallow ground ice this in, in these intermediate uh, uh, latitudes, uh, such as the, the, re the recently published uh, article about these scarps of exposed ice in these glacial, glacial terrains. And then finally, the lobate debris aprons or the, re the remnant glaciers, uh, where there are probably hundreds of centimeters. Again, doesn't, doesn't really solve the problem of where did all that water go, but if you need water on your next visit to Mars, we certainly have a lot of, a lot of options of uh, places to go. Uh, so again, just to, just to sum up, most of the known water ice is in the polar and also in these Arctic regions, as Phoenix has, has, has proven. It went there and it, it, it touched that uh, uh, Arctic ground ice. Uh, the remnant glaciers are found in the mid-latitudes. They're only found in a narrow band of the mid-latitudes, mostly in the north. There's a few in the south as well. But what that indicates, in addition to being a potential resource, is that there was a, a time period in the relatively recent past of Mars history, which is, tends to uh, maybe 100 or 200 million years, um, 
when there was enough uh, uh, weather and snowfall to build up these ice sheets and build up these glaciers that uh, are still found uh, today. Uh, the recent impacts expose the ice, very shallow ice in the upper meter or so, and we, we are continuing to gather evidence that there may be substantial amounts of ice in the, in the mid-latitudes, in, in the subsurface, in the, in the plains regions. So uh, the mid-latitudes, again, as I said at the beginning, they, they provide the potential, and I think there are some, some very clear cases where we know there is water at the mid-latitudes that can be accessible for our use, human use, um, in a relatively benign environment that is uh, away from the poles in the mid-latitudes of Mars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. That was a great summary of uh, the water reserves that we have available. Do we have any questions? We have about five minutes for questions. Hi, last, uh, last year at, at the conference uh, in Irvine, I um, asked John Grosinger about the possible role of electrical discharge effects due at the surface due to the uh, highly rarefied Martian atmosphere and uh, um, Jeff Landis answered the question, what do you, which is that there is a portion breakdown at the surface of about 12 volts. Uh, do you see that these electrical effects might be af affecting the distribution of water in any way? Uh, I'm probably not going to be able to illuminate uh, much uh, to answer your question. So, um, no? I, I'm not aware of that there are uh, electrostatic effects on, on uh, the distribution of water. No, I haven't, I haven't heard about that. I haven't really given it much thought. Hi. It might be a little bit off topic, but you are a planetary geologist. One of your color slides showed the Hellas Basin, Valles Marinaris, and the Tharsis volcanoes. And when you see those projected on a globe, the Hellas Basin seems almost on the opposite side of Mars, making me wonder, did Mars get whacked <clears throat> powerful enough to crack the crust and temporarily create volcanoes and maybe destroy the core magnetic field, just out of curiosity. Mars got whacked. I totally agree. Uh, the Hellas Basin is, was a global event. And I, uh, either you've read the literature or, or you're a great thinker because th this idea has been around. What, exactly what you described, that the Hellas Basin and, and Tharsis are ant antipodal, and that, that may not be a coincidence. Okay, now you're out of my realm. Yes, I'm a planetary geologist, but I'm not a, uh, a, a geophysicist that studies the uh, core dynamo. Sorry. Any other questions? Uh, talking about Tharsis and then Ophir, uh, which seems to be a collapsed area above Valles, uh, is that, I mean, there, there was a huge outflow there uh, through Candor. Uh, do you think there's any remnants, have you found any remnant water there? Well, it's not, it's not for lack of looking that, um, that we don't see the water there. Um, a lot of these outflow channels were targets for our for our radar study, um, but for what is possibly a variety of reasons, we don't seem to detect any any remnant ice in those areas. Um, I think what what the what the outflow and the collapse zones, these chaotic regions that seem to be the source for a lot of the outflows, what that tells me at least is that in the past and not so far back in Martian history, there was a sub substantial amount of ground water available, not just ground ice, but liquid water 
that that could reach the surface and could could be released uh, through these catastrophic episodes. And I guess my hunch, my intuition tells me that 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 process didn't dry out the whole planet. That there are probably still these deep aquifers. Uh, whether we'll ever be able to access them, that's, that's per perhaps an open question. But I think that if you go deep enough in Mars, you'll find liquid water still today. The, the impact structure that you showed um, reminded me very much of some that you see in the, in the high Arctic. It is, do you think that's not a coincidence? I'm thinking of in Canada, there's a few that have a sort of similar bullseye um, impact pattern. Uh, yeah, well, um, this is something that my, in my very first planetary geology class as an undergraduate, we had our first lab, which was uh, taking marbles and, and uh, firing them with slingshots into beds of sand of, of different uh, a real, rheological properties, different strength properties, and then looking at the resulting holes. And so on the Earth, the Earth is characterized in, on most of the continents by layered rocks. And by definition, that means you have one kind of rock overlying a different kind of rock. And uh, it's no surprise that a lot of the impact structures on Earth then get this kind of complex uh, appearance, which is not so common, say, on the moon, but uh, is, is more often seen on, the, on Mars. So yeah, that it's, there are some good analogies on the Earth for these uh, terraced craters. That, that's all the time that we have for questions. Uh, right now. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.